I'm Claire Smith and welcome to my channel. So today's video is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be a question and answer video. So back in August, I asked you all via the community tab here on YouTube to ask me questions. It could be anything. And loads of you responded. So today's video is me answering those questions. So if you haven't seen me before, I'm Claire Smith. I make videos all about perfume, perfume science, perfume history, perfume psychology. And I also just do some straight perfume reviews and also fun perfume tags. So if that kind of thing interests you and you haven't already done so, then please do consider subscribing. And please also like this video if you do end up liking this kind of content. So first off, I'd just like to thank everybody who has left me a question. I will try to answer as many as possible and I will try to touch on aspects of questions, even if I don't answer all of the questions that one person has asked me. But if you have left me a question, thank you so much for doing that because without you, this video would not exist. So what's the first question? So the first question is from Darina2408 and they ask, what is an outdated perfume for you? So I think outdated sometimes has quite a negative connotation to it. It suggests something that's not wanted or not needed. But I guess also it could mean something that is potentially just out of fashion. And, you know, you smell a fragrance, you might just think, wow, that's taking me back to the 90s. That's taking me back to the 80s. Certain styles have certain associations with certain periods of time, but people still love them. People still have a nostalgia for those types of fragrances. So really by saying they're outdated, are you saying they're irrelevant just for you or are you saying that they're irrelevant for everybody? It's a really hard thing to call, isn't it? It's really a construct that's been made by the designer perfume market, really, isn't it? It's, it's something that's really trying to dictate people's tastes and dictate trends in the market. And I think there's going to come a time when we're going to sniff a gourmand fragrance in the future and think, wow, that's so 2020s. That's, that just smells so old now. I would never wear that now. And I don't think it's going to be too far away. So yeah, I'm not sure there is something that's outdated, but there's definitely out of fashion. So Darina2408 also asks, Arabian perfumes, do you have any experience? Are they worth it? I think for me personally, they've not been worth it. And that's because I've had a really low hit rate with them. So I've tried loads of different fragrance brands and I've tried loads of different samples. I've even blind bought bottles from Latafa and also from Afnan. And I've ended up decluttering all of those fragrances. I think the one that I actually enjoyed the most out of everything that I've sampled has been Armaf Club de Noé Intense Woman. That's supposed to be a clone of Tom Ford's Noir de Noir. And I, I do think there are differences between that fragrance and Noir de Noir. But... I think they are along the same lines and just independently of the fact that it resembles Noir de Noir. I just do really like Claude de Nuit Intense Woman. I think it's a nice fragrance. I think the fragrance that I owned a bottle of and that I kept the longest and that I enjoyed the most was Latafa Emir Al Oud Intense Oud. But again, with that fragrance, there were things about it that I didn't enjoy. So I think I'm just really sensitive to things like synthetic ouds. I'm really sensitive to saffron. Um, saffron, when it's done badly for me, can smell rubbery or plasticky. And that was the case with a lot of fragrances. Also, I'm quite sensitive to ambrox derivatives, like ambroxan. And I smell a lot of that in fragrances, for example, from the brand Afnan. So I think you just need to try the different brands and maybe just see what's for you but I get it because it's really difficult to sample those fragrances and they just have so much hype behind them and people know making videos that those kinds of fragrances get so many views because they're so affordable everybody can afford that kind of fragrance so I think that's also part of the hype behind them but I can see also why people would choose to buy those because they are incredibly strong they are incredibly long lasting in the main and they are just really affordable so yeah um, I think it just depends on what you want from fragrance and what your preferences are and also what you can smell in fragrance. Some people just can't smell Ambrox, can they? And lucky them. I would love not to be able to smell Ambrox derivatives in fragrance, but they just ruin so many fragrances for me. So naturally, Liz41 asks, what made you explore a career in science? I actually had a big interest in science, even from a very young age. My dad's a farmer and he was always encouraging me to look at why things were and try to explain the world to me. And I really think that really prompted my curiosity and made me want to ask more questions. And also when I got to university, that interest was there, but I don't think I picked necessarily the right course for me for my undergraduate degree. It took me a while to get back into education and to actually want to do a PhD. 
But once I started doing a PhD, I just realised this was going to be my career for life. This was what I really wanted to do. And now I'm a lecturer, you know, and that's so rare, isn't it, to be a permanent member of academic staff after doing a PhD. I just always wanted to do it, basically. And I've always wanted to help people, to help people understand the world and help to develop new therapies for diseases and help to further our knowledge of the genetics of diseases as well. I just find it super interesting. So Zabruda asked, did you ever consider a career in perfumery and have you dabbled in fragrance yourself? No to both things. I've never considered a career in perfumery and I've never really made a fragrance. I think the closest I've come to making fragrances was when I was little, I would take rose petals and lavender from the garden and I would soak it in oils. I'd even use things like baby oil, soak flowers in baby oil. It must have smelled absolutely disgusting. But those oils always tended to disappear after a few weeks. I'd put them in jam jars or things like that. And I guess my mum would just chuck them away. I was very much into experimenting at home. And I, I guess that's probably annoying, isn't it? After a while, you probably just want to tidy stuff away. But yeah, that, that's about as far as it went. So Simply The Best Girl asks, do you have a partner and have you travelled outside of the UK? Yes, I do have a partner. And yes, I have travelled outside of the UK. So I've been to the US a few times because my brother lives there. So it's a great excuse to go. But also I've been across Europe. So I've been to France several times, Germany several times, Spain several times. And I've also been to Switzerland, Denmark, Netherlands, um, Austria, Hungary, Croatia, Czech Republic. I think that's probably about everything, but I probably missed one. So yeah, I've, I've travelled quite a lot within Europe, but I've not really been outside of Europe other than to the US. And I would really like to go to, to more places. I, that's really on my on my to-do list to travel more. So Yulia Bonda, 1979. Hi, Yulia. She asks, what has changed in your daily life since you started your YouTube channel? I think it's really that I just don't ever fully switch off from YouTube. I used to just watch the occasional video, not really spend that much time on YouTube. But actually, when you have a channel, you spend an awful lot of time watching other videos and you really just get into the topic. You really start becoming quite obsessive about it, I guess. Also, I think because I get so many comments throughout the week, which is absolutely lovely and I love responding to comments. I think that's really the best part of YouTube. I just really like chatting with people and I like, you know, if they've got a question, I like trying to answer it. And as long as I've got time in my life to do that, I'm always hoping that I will be able to get back to people. But as I've grown, it has become a lot more work for me to do that. I do think that doing YouTube has helped me with my presentation skills. I really feel like I can structure how I give information now much better than I could do before. And I also feel like I'm just more confident. I'm more confident when I'm presenting information to other people. And the final thing really is that I think I smell much more interesting than I once did. I think I've just learned a lot more about fragrance and I have a much more diverse collection of fragrances. Borisova asks, which is the next fragrance that you want to purchase? Do you have a wish list? Yes, I do have a wish list. Probably the, the next fragrance that I would like to buy and one I've been searching for for a while at a reasonable price is Oud Rosewood. So those do your Privé line fragrances. I've tried so many of them and I really do like Oud Rosewood. I think the other one that I keep on going back to try and I probably will just buy eventually. I've been talking about this one for about a year now. I'm very much a ditherer when it comes to purchasing fragrances. If I can get it for cheaper, I'll hang on. But basically, I think I'm just going to buy it because I never see it at a reasonable price. And that's Orpheon from Diptyque. I really like that fragrance. I also would really like some more amouage in my life but I also feel like a lot of them are being reformulated and I'm a bit hesitant to go for a reformulation um so I really liked Portrayal I really like Lilac Love but I know that Lilac Love has been reformulated now so I don't know whether to go for that or not but yeah um there are a few on my list and some of them are crazily expensive and I'm just waiting for a deal and then other ones are more reasonably priced and I tend to buy those much quicker. So Andrea Morales Nabarro 1548 says, if you were a fragrance, which notes would you have? So I think I'd be a dark musky fragrance. So musk in the base, but not really a white musk, a dark sort of smoky musk almost. Something like, you know, as I described the ink spreading across water, like, like the musk in the base of Lolita Limpica, that kind of musk. 
And then I think I'd have some kind of fruity top note, maybe something like raspberry. I really like raspberry or maybe cherry, I think. Um, and then I think in the mid, I'd have some purple florals. So maybe heliotrope or lilac or hyacinth or wisteria or maybe even violet or something like that. But I think, yeah, I just really like purple florals. It'd be something like that. Or maybe even rose. I really do like rose as well. So Andrea also asked me about synesthesia and asked me to name fragrances in response to feelings. I've actually made a video very much like that. So I'm just going to leave that one linked up above in case you do want to check that out but I'm going to do a few of them so she says love and I'm going to choose shop on love it's just a, a bunch of red roses I don't think I could choose anything anything better for that freedom um, I'm going to choose Lola by Marc Jacobs because that was my fragrance in my 20s and I felt like I could do anything so I guess that's the fragrance for me to choose and empathy I'm going to choose Violet Ida by Miller Harris that fragrance always makes me think of something enveloping like a hug but it also makes me think of cake. I think just having someone listen to you while you eat cake and drink tea is just the epitome of empathy, isn't it? So that's why I'm choosing Violet Ida. Doc M5314 asks, what's the rate of perfume releases compared with the release rate 10 years ago? OK, so the number of fragrances that are being released today is around 6,000 per year. And 10 years ago, it was around 4,000 per year. So we've had a 50% increase in 10 years. So Vutat1443 asks, what is your research field and your research interests? So I currently work on tooth enamel and this is really a new job for me. So I'm sort of starting again after having done this a few years back. I've come back to the same thing to be a lecturer. So Originally, I was trying to identify the genes that are involved in tooth enamel formation. So in some people, their process of enamel formation just goes wrong. They have either very thin enamel or they have enamel that breaks down very easily. So it's soft or it's brittle in some way. And we all know that enamel is something that doesn't have any capacity for cellular repair. It's not like bone or something that's going to knit back together if you damage it. Once it's damaged or if it's not formed properly, it's like that for life. So these people really suffer a lot from social anxiety because everything we do in a social context, we show our teeth, don't we? If you're eating with someone, you show your teeth. If you're communicating with someone, you will show your teeth because smiling and nonverbal communication is really important. Also, these people have lifelong pain and it's just not very nice for them to have to go and go to the dentist and have all this very intensive dental treatment that's very, very costly throughout their lives. And there just really aren't any actual proper treatments. Really, the only focus is on maintaining how the teeth look and maintaining their function for as long as possible. So my initial research was to identify those genes that cause problems with the dental enamel. So the genes that are really involved in dental enamel formation. Now we're at a point where we know so many of the genes that are involved in dental enamel formation that we don't know much about what they do. So what I'm doing now is... I'm taking stem cells. So stem cells are cells that can actually be derived into any type of cell in your body. And I'm going to put in mutations that I found in patients into those stem cells. And then I'm going to change those stem cells, derive them into the cells that form enamel. And I'm going to study what happens. I'm going to see what's going wrong in those cells and try and work out what's happening. And then also hopefully try and develop some kind of therapy to try and stop it. So if I actually was able to give a medication to a child, I could perhaps prevent them from having enamel defects in some, maybe even all of their secondary dentition, of their permanent teeth. So I'm hoping that's what I'm going to achieve. So Sharda asks, how do I spray perfume and how many sprays do I use and where? So I think it depends on whether I want other people to smell me. Also the situation I'm going to. So am I going to work or somewhere where it might be inappropriate for other people to smell me? And what type of fragrance I'm wearing as well. So is it something that's super strong anyway? Or is it something that's quite light? Something that's on the strong side, I'm probably only going to spray it, you know, two or three times. And I'm going to concentrate on areas that are more covered up. So maybe the chest area, for example. If it's something that's lighter, I might spray it more and in more different areas. But generally, I will spray in the chest area and on the back of my neck. So that's probably a total of about six sprays in general, if it's not a super strong one. 
I will also spray my hair sometimes. I will spray the insides of my elbows and even the backs of my knees if those are also exposed. So perhaps I'm wearing a summer dress or something that gives you a really nice scent bubble. I also sometimes will just spray the outer layer of my clothing. So perhaps I'm wearing a coat if I'm going out in the evening because it's really hard for people to smell your fragrance if it's several layers deep. And that really helps it to project a little bit more, doesn't it, by spraying the outside layer. I actually also wear fragrances to bed, especially in the winter. I really like lavenders and vanillas for bed in the winter. I find them really comforting and really help me get off to sleep. I think really I can end up wearing maybe even three fragrances a day. So I'll wear one in the morning before I leave for work. I'll perhaps take the bottle with me to work and refresh it at lunchtime. And then I'll choose a different one in the evening and perhaps even another one for going to bed in. So I can end up wearing a lot of fragrance during one day. So Alison Botts 8532 asks, how did your perfume passion begin? I don't think there's actually one particular incident that really sparked it. I think I was always interested in scents generally. I remember as a child, I would collect soaps. I actually had a collection of soaps that I think was over a hundred at one point. And I just really liked the shapes and the colours, but also the fragrances that they had as well. And that sort of annoyed my mum and she made me use them all up. And it took years and years and years, but I did. And then I just got into fragrance and really it was the, the gift that I always wanted at Christmas, the gift I always wanted at birthdays. And by the time 2020 rolled round, I had a collection of between about 25 and 30 fragrances. And it just suddenly dawned on me that I was actually quite interested. And as soon as lockdown came, I just realised that I really enjoy going to stores and smelling different fragrances and experiencing them. And I couldn't do that any longer because of lockdown. And so I just started watching lots of YouTube and getting really into fragrance content. And that's really what sparked the YouTube channel, really. But yeah, I think I've always had a bit of an interest. I just never really fully realised it. So Cat Woods asks, which are some of your current favourites at the moment? And also, which notes do you really enjoy and which notes do you tend to dislike? So I think the two fragrances I've been reaching for most this last month, which bearing in mind, I've got a perfume tray at the moment and I'm really trying to mostly stick to using my perfume tray. So I am feeling a bit neutered with my perfume choices. But the one that I've been reaching for most this month has been Kenzo Whirl. The one that's new in my collection that I have just been wanting to wear more and more and more is Nancy Malin's Eglantier. I put that on my perfume tray in August because I just knew if it wasn't on my perfume tray, I'd wear it anyway. So it had to go on my perfume tray. So I think my, some of my favourite notes would be things like raspberry, cherry, purple florals, like heliotrope, like violet. I really like the sweeter type of violet rather than the fuzzy warm kind of violet. Also, I like lilac, wisteria, um, hyacinth, leathers, particularly suede, musks, ambrette, chestnut. I really like in fragrances as well. I really like that kind of creaminess that you get with chestnut. Rose too. Rose is really diverse. You can get very different smelling roses in fragrances. And I really like the deeper style of rose, but I also quite like the soft pink rose too. And also the Thaif rose. On the other hand, notes that I struggle with are things like saffron sometimes, if it's too overwhelming. I really dislike some synthetic ouds. I mean, I would say that probably most of the fragrances with oud in them I've smelt would be synthetic accords rather than the real thing. I like the warmer, softer, more enveloping oud. I don't really like the metallic, cold, medicinal ouds. I also dislike amberwood. So that's a synthetic molecule that I just find a little bit raspy. And also, I don't really like um, Ambroxan or Isoe Super that much, although it depends on the context with Ambroxan. And I think there are just so many different types of Ambrox derivative compounds that I don't know which ones I like and which ones I don't. And it's really hard to tell in fragrances, isn't it, sometimes which one it is. But one of those Ambrox derivatives I'm really not keen on. Also, Isoe Super is something I really struggle with. Um, I just think it can make things smell like a cleaning product. and it's really the reason I've decluttered a few fragrances. So I think those are the things that I can really struggle with. It just kind of depends on dose, doesn't it? Sometimes they're absolutely fine. Other times they're just overwhelming the rest of the fragrance and that's all you can smell. Jinkat1318 asks, do you have any other passions? For example, jewellery. 
yes, I really like vintage clothing. Um, I don't collect it to the degree that I collect fragrance. I'm far more reserved and I only buy things that I know that I will wear. I like to actually wear the clothing I buy. I don't, I'm not someone who sort of stores it like a museum. I'm definitely someone who wears it. So yeah, clothing. Also, I really like vintage handbags and I really like secondhand jewellery as well. I never really buy anything new that I can buy secondhand. So Achar Mr. Simple asks, best perfumes under £30? So I find this question really difficult because I tend to buy fragrance secondhand and that's probably why I have absolutely no concept of how much things cost really because I will always just search for a deal. But I think the ones, if you were going to buy them retail, that you could get for under £30 would be something like SJP Stash. Um, that you can get on Amazon for about £18, I think, currently in the UK. Also, if you wanted a more modern alternative to that, you could try um, Billie Eilish number two. I saw that recently in my local Superdrug for, I think it was £20 for a 100ml bottle and 10ml um, like travel spray. But that was quite a good deal. I also really like Floor Street Alang Alang Espresso. You can get 10 mil of their fragrances for £29 in little travel sprays. I think actually quite a lot of their range is really nice. Um, I really like the darker fragrances as opposed to the lighter ones, but that's just my personal taste. Marks and Spencer in the UK are actually a great place to go for fragrances. I think their Fragonard fragrances are a little bit over £30, but you might be able to find something for around £30 in there. Definitely go and check out Fragonard in Marks and Spencer's and actually even their Discover range of fragrances are pretty good. And I think they're about 10 or £11 actually a bottle. They're not expensive at all. I personally really like Ceruti 1881, but I understand that's not for everyone. It's quite a vintage feeling fragrance, but it's kind of an aquatic floral, but also with quite a strong sort of muskiness to it almost. But definitely something along the lines of a 90s style floral. The fragrances you can get in And Other Stories are also worth trying. Those are by Jerome Epinet, so the same bloke who did Byredo fragrances. So if you like Byredo, you might want to try And Other Stories. And finally, I would say Jupe Le Bain. So Jupe Le Bain, I think when I bought my bottle, was, was nine or ten pounds. It's not an expensive fragrance at all. It does have a slightly vintage vibe because it has some aldehydes there and it also has this really powdery feeling vanilla and the vanilla's with benzoin as well which makes it even more powdery but it also has a sort of slightly almondy almost cherry twang to it almost but it also feels a bit calming and spa-like. It's a really interesting fragrance and I think it's a total bargain for £10. So Lizzie at Rosen Jones asks, if you could work with one brand to make a fragrance, which would it be? And also, if you could design a fragrance, what would be your fragrance idea? So I think with the brand, I'd want to work with a smaller brand. So I'd want to probably go with an indie brand because I'd want more control over how it smelt in the end. I'd like control over how my vision was translated into a fragrance and I'd want to be involved in sniffing it at different developmental stages and having more say about how it was developed. I don't think I'm someone obviously who has any kind of knowledge of perfumery. I've never made a fragrance in my life so I would be heavily reliant on that person so I'd have to really really trust them. So it'd have to be someone that I'd met several times and that I really had you know, really strong belief in that they would carry out my vision as I would want it, basically. And I'd have to really like their fragrances as well. So I think there are actually loads of indie fragrance houses that I would love to work with. And I don't think I'm going to name one in particular because I don't think I'd be picky, actually, from the large array of talented people out there. But it would definitely be a smaller brand because I think you just have more overall control. I think with my fragrance idea, it would probably be wildly unpopular. And this is probably why I'm never, ever going to make my own fragrance. And I, I just don't really feel like, you know, who am I? I'm, I'm someone on YouTube who makes videos. Why should I make a fragrance? Why do, why do I know any more about this than anybody else? You know, I just think that it's a, a kind of ridiculous that I would have a fragrance line. But obviously everybody thinks about it. And I think my idea would be based around film characters. So I really, really enjoy films. And I would take a film character from each decade and translate that into a fragrance. So my 1940s film character would be Laura from a Brief Encounter. I would take her as an essence and kind of try and bottle it. So Laura is very... Um, you know, she stands up for 
values, but then she gets kind of swept away in romance and ideas. So I'd have her as strong white florals, but with some bubbling desires under the surface. So I'd have sort of some like tuberose or some jasmine perhaps, or even some gardenia, but also I would have some, I don't know, some leather or some aldehydes underneath that to just kind of lift it and make it like there was an undercurrent of, of passion and desire there. Perhaps even some ivy, some greenness there as well. My 70s fragrance would be based around Judy. So Judy is played by Barbara Streisand in the film What's Up Doc. And she's a really kooky character. She knows a lot. She is someone who is really intelligent, but just can't get through university course. And she's always got a quick one liner to come back at people with. So Judy and fragrance would be something with lots of energy and zing. So she would be maybe ginger, perhaps some tyfe rose, some incense and some patchouli. My 2000s fragrance would be based around Charlotte in Lost in Translation. So Charlotte is thoughtful and she's just really lost her way in the world. And she's looking for someone to help her out of where she is, to help her out of her situation and really to just discover herself again. So Charlotte would be something thoughtful and contemplative. So something quite gentle feeling, something maybe with some green tea, perhaps some sandalwood, perhaps some cardamom something like that. So yeah, that would be my idea. Lots of fragrances based around film characters from different decades. So Laws Draws, great name, asks, I'd love to know your one fragrance for each season and your top three ride or die year round fragrances. I really need to make a top 10 for life video, don't I? I haven't done that for about two and a half years. Um, so I think I've addressed this in a tag video, actually. Um, I went through the seasons and said which fragrance I would choose for each season, I think. But for some, I'd probably go with Found at Dusk by Mela Harris or Jasmine des Anges by Christian Dior. Autumn would be Orchid Soleil by Tom Ford or Bouquet Encore by Le Cachet Parfums. Winter would be La Petite Robe Noire Black Perfecto by Galan or Jungle L'Elephant by Kenzo. And Spring would be Reminiscence Heliotrope and also Insolence by Galan. I'll leave the top three ride or die for a top 10 for life video. So that's the end of part one. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have enjoyed it, then please press the like button and please also consider subscribing if you haven't done already and please come back for part two. So thank you so much and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.